Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's TPC webinar entitled Fundamentals of Solar Photovoltaic Systems. My name is Ryan Smith. I'm going to be your presenter today during today's session. Um, as we get started to really talk about this fundamental um, concepts and some maintenance procedures with solar photovoltaic systems, I wanted to let everyone know as you're flowing in um, a couple of the little housekeeping items before we get started. First things first, uh, this webinar is being recorded and the video recording of this presentation will be made available on our TPC training website uh, within about two business days from this event. So be on the lookout for that. Secondly, I'd like to also indicate that this session is live. So that means uh, you're actually free to uh, ask any questions you like throughout the session in the Q&A box. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. Um, that you can type in your questions. Be aware, there's a chat button too that we're not going to be monitoring. So uh, you wanna avoid using chat and instead use the official Q&A so we can monitor the different questions coming in. And finally, with that recording will be a PDF of these slides available uh, for download at that time. So um, that's kind of a little bit of, of some of the housekeeping to get out of the way. Uh, the last thing I want to check in with everyone here who's flowing in is just to learn a little bit more about who's here by doing a little introductory poll with everyone as we start to talk about some of the PV stuff we're going to talk about today and some of the fundamentals. I'm going to launch a poll for you all right now. And so a window should be popping up on your screen with three questions. The first question being, how comfortable are you with explaining how solar panels work? in terms of the function of how they produce electricity. Are you very comfortable explaining that? Somewhat comfortable, kind of neither here nor there. Are you pretty uncomfortable? You're not really sure how to explain it or you just really don't know how to explain it. Uh, the second thing, uh, how often do you work on solar panels in your daily job? Is it often, is it occasionally every now and then, rarely or never right now? And that's okay if you never work on them now. Uh, that's the point of learning about some of the fundamentals to get you started. And the third question we have is, which statement best describes your interest in the solar topic? I am presently responsible for maintaining and operating solar panels. I may be operating or maintaining solar panels in the near future, or I don't work on solar panels now, but I wanna learn more about them. Just a little bit no more about who's here and what you're hoping to learn. Okay, we got a good collection of answers coming in. I'll give you just a few more moments to make your selections. Yeah, you can go ahead and uh, click each answer you want to indicate and then hit submit at the bottom of the three question poll. It should uh, release your answers there. Okay, good. I think we're getting a good evening out of the answers coming in. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and then share the results with everyone here. So you should see a different window popping up with all the results uh, from today's poll. As you can imagine the uh, level of comfortableness, I guess, the level of comfort um, on explaining how a solar panel works, it's across the board. So really it's an even split from people who are somewhat comfortable to people who are somewhat uncomfortable explaining how solar panels work in the whole photovoltaic process. So we're gonna explain that and break that down a little bit in today's webinar. Uh, the second question is, uh, how often do you work on solar panels? So most of you do not presently work on solar panels at all. And I, which kind of leads us to the prevailing answer from number three, which is most of you are coming into this uh, session having not worked on solar panels and, and not working on solar panels presently, but you do want to learn more about them. And so that's really going to be the motivation for this session. It's going to be the basics. It's going to be kind of starting off the, um, the breaking down of some of the terms of solar panels, how they work, how to maybe understand some of the things you might start seeing on spec sheets for solar panels and what to look out for um, during the initial installation and maintenance of these solar panels. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing the results. I appreciate your input, thanks so much. All right, so that window should have uh, disappeared from me. If it didn't, go ahead and just hit the X button and we'll go ahead and get started. So the really the breakdown of today's session is going to be all about um, first and foremost explaining the fact that 
these devices are primarily electrical devices. So solar power can't really be fully understood unless we understood electricity itself. Electricity is a big part of what TPC does in the training business, you know, learning about electricity and how to do electrical troubleshooting. And all those types of skills apply when you're trying to understand how solar panels work as well. So that means we really have to break down the three fundamental basics of electricity and how it works to really understand how a solar panel works. Uh, that's electrical current, electrical voltage and resistance. And, and knowing how those three work together is important and how they're related is really important in understanding a solar panel. So this is where we're gonna start is kind of on the electrical thing real quick and understanding some of the terms there. Then we're gonna jump into for a few minutes of the so solar photovoltaic process. So the process of converting the sun's light into energy and, and how that works. Um, knowing a little bit more about the materials used in solar panels and, and how they're put together. And then finally, we're going to end today's session on just some of the best practices we have documented um, on how to maintain and take care of solar panels um, as, as someone who might be responsible for that now or in the future. First and foremost, these three here, I could tell you, it, it, even if someone's been working as an electrician for 30 years, right, still need to refresh yourself on knowing the difference between electrical current, electrical voltage, and electrical resistance, and kind of how they all play together. Uh, it, it can get pretty easy to mix up current and voltage. They might be kind of intermixed in terms of terminology. Or, you know, which one causes which? Does current cause voltage or does voltage cause current? That kind of stuff. It's really important as we start understanding IV curves, which we're going to talk about today for, for uh, solar photovoltaic panels or um, the short circuit current or the open circuit voltage, all the stuff that is going to be on these spec sheet for panels, we have to know. First and foremost, let's talk about current. So current really is the amount of electrons flowing through the wire and that's able to pr be produced. Think of it as a, a flow of water through a pipe is similar to a uh, flow of electrons, negatively little charged electrons through the wire. And again, uh, we can break this down in more detail if you take a basics of electricity course, but I'll just kind of keep it brief for now. We got all the electrons flowing through the wire. What's behind them pushing? That's the voltage. So basically, if you think about um, a water hose analogy, right? The water flowing through a hose, if you turn that hose on, is the uh, current. And then how open you made that spigot or that, that faucet at, at the house um, and how open that is, is the voltage. So if it's fully open, that's a high voltage, which will cause more current or water to flow. And then the size of that nozzle at the end where it sprays out into wherever it's spraying into, that's the resistance. So if there's more resistance, that means less current will flow um, in the system. And that resistance can be found in whatever devices are usually hooked up to that, that um, device providing the voltage. So for instance, you know, loads, we call them, uh, uh, appliances, light bulbs, motors, and that kind of thing. So which part of the equation are we really going to be talking most about and, and where does a solar panel come into play? Well, the solar panel is, if you see my little red laser pointer here, a solar panel really is the thing in the electrical circuit that provides a voltage for that electrical circuit. And it's actually an alternative way to provide a voltage than what we normally do in this uh, day and age. We normally get our voltage, our um, push for our electrons to flow through our homes and our businesses, through um, our electrical grid, which is connected to all of our, you know, hundreds of miles of utility wires and power plants throughout this country. This time, uh, we're able to produce a voltage directly from the sun's light, whether it's on our own roof or a nearby uh, a location that's producing electricity from the sun instead of from our utility grid. And that's really what solar power is all about, is creating this push on the electrons to move and to power our TVs and our lights and all that kind of stuff in another kind of way. So thinking of the push, the, the more push, the more voltage, the more current. To answer that question I posed to you just a moment ago, can you have current without voltage? Well, the answer is no, you cannot have any current without some sort of push to make that electron current flow. Now, let me put it the other way. Can you have a voltage without current? And the answer is absolutely yes. So you can have a voltage, you can have that potential, we call it. And that's another word to describe voltage. You can have that push or that potential happening, but 
but without an actual completed path to make that uh, electron flow. So that's kind of the difference. You can have a voltage without a current, a kind of waiting push ready for current to flow as soon as you make that path, but you cannot have a current without a voltage. So really the way they all play together is that one volt of electromotive force or what we call, that's what voltage used to be called in days past. We, we kind of changed that term to be volts. So one volt of voltage or electromotive force will force one amp, the way we measure current, of current to flow through a wire. Um, in this case to one ohm, so the way we measure resistance or how much the appliance or device is holding back or even the wires themselves, everything has resistance, is holding back that current. The more resistance that builds up around the solar panels and in the system, the less uh, current will be able to flow from those solar panels and the dimmer your lights are gonna be connected to those solar panels. This is how they all play together in terms of math. If, if any of you here like math, this is kind of how it all comes together. Uh, so E is that electromotive force or voltage, we call it. I is, it's interesting, I was always curious about why we use the letter I for current. Even the letter I isn't in the word current. Well, the, uh, the letter I comes from initially from the French word of an intensity. So current was first kind of observed as an intensity of current. The more, the more cur current flowing, the more intense that feeling was if you touched that wire, right? And so that kind of I stuck around, but it turned into the word current over the years since you know the 1800s and then r is resistance which makes sense to us so this pie chart really indicates that if if you know the voltage of your solar panels and you know the resistance you're going to be hooking up the device to if you know any two of these ingredients in your electrical system you can find out the third ingredient by uh doing a little bit of math so the way this works let's say you you don't know the voltage you don't know what the voltage is but you know what the current that's flowing and you and you've measured the current, the amps that are flowing, and you measure the resistance, you just cover up the part you don't know. So let's say you covered up this, this letter E with your hand, you see an I and R left over next to each other. So that means you take the I times the R. So you take the number of amps times the number of ohms of resistance, and that gives you the number of, um, the number of volts that are, are in action or required to make that many amps go through that many ohms. Uh, in a lot of cases, we'll know the voltage of our panel because it's on the nameplate, and we'll, we, we'll know the resistance because that's on the nameplate of the device, let's say. But we're not sure how much current is going to flow, and let's say how big our wires need to be to hold that amount of current. So a common application is we cover up the I because we're not sure how many amps are going to flow. And then we find out that E over R, because E is on top of the R this time. So if we cover up the I, it'll be E over R, or voltage divided by current, to get the number of amps. So let's say we have you know, 10, uh, 10 volts or let's say 24 volts and two ohms, that's 24 divided by two. And that gives us 12 amps that will flow, for instance. Okay. So they all play together. And then one interesting way to bring them together in terms of how to understand solar panel uh, nameplates and ratings is this power. So we sometimes mix up the term power, the, in other words, what our uh, meters are reading in the backyard of our homes and our businesses is voltage, right? Or so it's measuring some sort of voltage or current flowing. Well, it's none of the above. It's actually both um, together multiplied. So if you take the voltage at any given moment coming into your facility and you multiply it by the current flowing in that moment of time, that gives you a um, measurement of volts times amps, then you put that together to get watts, watts. And so watts is the measure of power. And that's really what you're going to see um, in a solar panel nameplate is how many watts does that solar panel give you? So that means how many amps times volts together in combination can that solar panel give you? And let's say the solar panel's out for 24 hours. So it's going to give you a certain amount of volts coming from that solar panel we're going to talk about the magic of how that happens and then how many amps it delivers um, and the magic of how that happens 
you multiply that together over 24 hours and that gives you watts times hours and that gives you what we call watt hours or multiply that by a thousand to make it easier to read it's kilowatt hours or a thousand watt hours delivered in that day let's say or however long you want to say over the course of a month usually is how our utilities measure kilowatt hours used so you take the volts and amps being used multiply it by the number of hours it was being generated and you get kilowatt hours and that's normally how our electrical utilities charge us for our electricity or if you're going to be one of the lucky folks who have their solar panels hooked up as a net metering solution that you can actually charge back the utility a certain dollars per kilowatt hour uh, based on how these are producing their volts and amps over the number of hours. So obviously at, in the middle of the night, midnight, a uh, solar panel is gonna produce zero kilowatt hours. Um, but as the, the sun comes up and things start increasing um, in terms of light, then they're gonna produce uh, more kilowatt hours, but you average it out over the course of the day to get a kind of average kilowatt hours or total kilowatt hours for the day. Or for the month. So watts is important. Watts are not volts and watts are not amps. They're a mixture of both. That's, that's another important one. So once we kind of get that down, take some practice to really start talking the talk of watts, kilowatts, voltage, amps. This is where we can start really talking about the solar panel itself. I know you haven't even seen a picture of a solar panel yet on the screen, but it's coming now. So to understand how photovoltaic works, if you think about it now, photo, that's light, right? So photons and that kind of thing. Volts is creating voltage, right? So voltage, so creating light or so creating volts from light. And in other words, creating volts from the sun's light because that's the most intense energy free of freely available light we have. So is there a way to create voltage and electricity immediately from light? And the answer is yes, we discovered it over the last several decades. And so let's talk about that. The first and most important building block of what it takes to convert light into voltage is what we call the solar cell. And this is what one looks like. This is not a solar panel that sometimes can get confused. A solar cell is not a solar panel. This little thing is just a frac, you know, one inch wide by one inch long. So it's a tiny little thing. Um, they, they come in different shapes and sizes, but in this case, this can fit in the palm of your hand. This is a single cell. And what this does is magically, the sun will shine on this cell and immediately be turned into electricity. And that's one thing that's, uh, pretty amazing about solar power is that there is no moving parts in a solar panel um, or a photovoltaic system. They literally just sit there, never moving, never, uh, you know, having any vibration or uh, strain or, you know, bearings and, and, and misalignments and pumps and motors and that kind of thing, generators to do what they do. They, they just do what they do naturally, just from the sake of what they are. And so we're, we got to talk about that. But essentially, this, this is able to immediately take the sun's energy, turn it into uh, electrical energy instantly. And so a cell about this big can do that and produce about 0 0.5 volts of, of push or potential, we call it, for an electron to flow. That's, remember, that's not amps. That's not you know powering my light bulb yet. We have to know how many amps it's going to pull through and how many watts it can do. So we, we get there. But for instance, does anything in my house, let's say your own home, what voltage does your cell phone need to plug into a wall, right? What voltage does your television or your refrigerator need to plug into the wall, right? Well, it's not half a volt, that's for sure. They need a little bit more push on their electrons to get them to work because they have high resistance. So uh, and ends up being, you know, in today's modern day, we in the United States power our devices on 120 volts. So we need 120 volts. So this single solar cell is not going to work for us. We need more. Um, so what do we do? Well, thankfully, through the magic of uh, electrical circuits, we can string together multiple of these cells in a row. And then each time we get a new one in the row, we add that 0.5 volts again. So we get 0.5 volts and then one volt and then one and a half, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four until we get a whole solar panel that can be, you know, 30 volts, 35 volts, or even more, um, depending on how many cells you can fit into a single, what we call solar module. And that's really how we can get a system up to 120 volts. 
but before we start building blocks um, with these solar cells, I want to show you one more thing about this solar cell. Let's talk about energy in versus energy out. This is the most important thing to consider. Um, and this is where you can start really impressing your coworkers and colleagues about your knowledge of solar power is this idea of efficiency of a solar cell. So we all know that the sun's light is shining on a solar panel. And then that solar panel through what it does or that solar cell, right? It takes the sunlight's energy in Watts it seems strange to con consider the sun's energy to be watts. We usually think of a light bulb or something in watts, but yeah, the sun's light energy can be measured in watts. And then on the output of this solar cell, it takes a smaller proportion. You see that smaller sized arrow here is the electrical energy that it's giving us in watts. So the number of watts coming in from the sun turns into a smaller amount of watts being produced by the solar panel. So we didn't, we weren't able to harness all of the watts from the sun in these solar panels, unfortunately. But what we normally find out in a given case, let's say we want to learn how effective or how efficient is this solar cell in providing us the energy from the sun's light. Well, uh, the, the efficiency it number is what we talk about. So we take whatever is coming out and we divide it by what it came in to pro provide us with that amount of power. And that gives us an efficiency. For instance, if we got 100 watts of the sunlight's power and the solar cell produced 15 watts of power on its output, we can do the math, uh, 15 divided by 100. And that's 15%. So that, that's 15 over 100, 0.15 or 15%. That's the efficiency of this solar cell. For every 100 watts it's given, it only produces 15 watts, right? And that's typical. So what we find is a typical, this is another really good thing to just impress your coworkers with hopefully, is a typical solar cell efficiency right now of the typical um, material for solar cells, which we're going to get into, is about 15 to 20% efficient when it's brought to market. Granted, when these are sitting in a laboratory, you know, in the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, for instance, in a very ideal condition, these can get up to, you know, 30, 40% efficient in the lab. But once they're out in the real world with clouds coming over and day and night and leaves and dirt and wind and all this stuff, the, the typical efficiency of a solar cell is at 15 to 20%. So that doesn't seem great, right? 15% efficient, if, if, it, if anyone said, yeah, I'm 15% efficient at getting my job done, that's not very effective. But you got to remember that the sun's light is freely available. It's going to shine on that rooftop or shine on the ground uh, or wherever you install these freely, right? And, and it's not really going to cost you money. And so getting 15% of something that's free, well, that's free, that's freely available energy at that point, as long as you can incur the cost of installation. So that's something to consider here. Um, another fun fact is that the word we use to indicate the sunlight's energy in watts available, let's say, in a certain location is something we call insolation. So not insulation like we see in wires or in our wall, but insolation with an O, um, the solar radiation uh, of a certain area. So you get more insulation or watts per meter squared in some a place like uh, you know, Southern California or Texas or Florida, because you're closer to the equator, then you do somewhere further north like Seattle or, um, or Michigan, because the sun is not as direct up there, for instance. So that's kind of an example of insulation. And it's good to know about that. Okay, so the sunlight's coming into the cell, the sunlight's coming out of the cell. Oops. Taking a look at the cell, it's still, it still might be a mystery, right, to anyone listening about Okay, it's creating energy, but how, right? It's, there's got to be something moving, right? There's got to be something working. And it's pretty amazing. It all happens at the subatomic level. So to, to help uh, just refresh some of our memory from high school physics class, <laughs> bring yourself back to high school or junior high or maybe even elementary school sometimes. Um, I didn't learn about this in elementary school, but some people I, I know are learning about that in elementary school, about electrons, protons, neutrons, and electrons. That's what this all comes down to with sol solar photovoltaic. Um, you might remember that electrons, the, the parts of an atom that flow through a circuit are negatively charged. So what manufacturers of solar panels do is they take a semiconductive material, so not a conductor, 
you may have heard of conductors. If you're any electrical folks on the call, know what a conductor is, because you see that word all the time in the National Electrical Code. Conductor, something that conducts electricity readily. That's, you know, metal, steel, um, copper, aluminum, that kind of thing. Versus the opposite of conductor, which is an insulator. That's, you know, rubber, wood, um, glass, that kind of stuff. What we need to make a solar panel work is something in between, something that's not quite a conductor like metal, but it's not, not quite an insulator like rubber. It needs to be somewhere in between. And the, a really good candidate for something that's kind of conductive in only certain situations is silicon. So this is something naturally occurring in the earth that is that can be found in large quantities that is a semiconductor. There's other materials out there like gallium arsenide and other things that we're experimenting with. But silicon, the element silicon is the perfect semiconductor for this. And so what we do is by itself, silicon is not super useful as in a solar panel until you start doping it, we call we call doping the silicon. And so what you're going to see is that the top layer, the, the layer that's facing the sun, is doped with an n-type semiconductor. So that silicon is turned into a negative charge or n-type versus the bottom layer that's kind of in the shade underneath is a positive type semiconductor P, p-type. Um, usually we use the element boron uh, to dope this semiconductor here, and we use the element phosphorus um, to dope with the silicon, kind of add in to the silicon as an additive um, on the bottom end. So what that ends up doing is it produces an extra electron in the cell structure, the crystal structure of the um, solar panel on the top end. So there's electro an, extra, uh, an extra electron floating around in this layer of the material right here. Well, electrons are negatively charged. And if you've ever held two magnets together, how do they attract and how do they repel? Well, you, we know that a negative and negative repel. So anything negatively charged repels a negatively charged electron floating around in here. And anything positively charged attracts that electron. However, right, so you see, okay, an electron's negatively charged. Where does it want to go? It wants to go to this positive side. But thanks to this separator here, this membrane, the electrons can't flow just directly down. So what's the only other way is to travel on this line we provided to it, and it's going to leave the solar panel, feel the pull to that negative, that positive side, but instead it's going to go all the way through our home or our business. It's going to power the devices and then come back out all used up and flow here. So this is actually, this arrow is showing electric current flowing that way, but that's not actually not right. It's going the other way. Um, so the holes of the electrical current are going that way, which they, some people call the holes of the electrical current. Anyway, the electrons go this way, this way, over, over, and back down again. And then they fill in the extra spot available for those electrons down here. And then through this membrane, they can replenish and start the process over again. So it's really, um, it's really an amazing process that all is kickstarted by the sun's light. So nothing's going to happen with that until that electron's allowed to jump suddenly from one area of this material to another, thanks to the ultraviolet and infrared and all the fun light, the energy in the sun's light makes this process happen. And it's amazing um, how it just magically happens with enough solar power, uh, with the sun shining. And so it just happens time and again, naturally, you don't see anything rotating and moving in here. And that's what really makes uh, solar panels pretty good in terms of uh, maintenance. And we're going to talk about the maintenance. So we've been talking about the cell, right? That single one little inch tab that you see on a solar panel. Obviously, there's way more to it than that. So the way we build them together, typically, is we see a cell. We bring a cell for a photovoltaic panel, and we put them all together in a string, like we mentioned, to, to kick up that voltage a little bit. And that turns us into a single module. If you want to talk the talk again, um, the term module is really what the industry uses to indicate the solar panel. So that single, that single off the shelf device with a, a bunch of cells put together in series is called a module. Or another word for it is a solar panel, right? So put all the cells together into a module. You put a bunch of modules together and to kick up that voltage even further from um, panel to panel to panel to kick up the current or to kick up the voltage, whatever you need. And that gives you an array. So basically a bunch of panels together give you a, sol a photovoltaic array. And then you put a bunch of arrays together 
to really pr start providing some, let's say, uh, a full house worth of um, electricity or a full business's worth of uh, electrical needs for whatever it, whatever it is, that gives you a system. But the system isn't just all the panels together. The system also includes all the other stuff, which we're going to just touch upon at the end of this. But that goes beyond the basics. So we don't really have time for it, but includes energy storage like batteries, voltage regulation and inverters and combiners and a bunch of other fun things. So here's a panel, right? Um, provided off the shelf from the manufacturer. You can see if you kind of count, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six cells in this row. Six times one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, six times 12. So that really gives you about 72 different cells put together at, at what is it, half a volt for cell, let's say. That's, that's gonna be about 37 volts for this uh, single panel, right? And you can look at its spec sheet to verify that. And so this panel in, in and of itself can't produce enough voltage, but then the more you um, put together, more panels you put together, the higher the voltage can be. So this semiconductor material, again, it's the silicon. Uh, and there's two different types of silicon out there in the market right now. And it, I think a, another really great way to talk the talk and to really start understanding some of these photovoltaic um, systems is to talk monocrystalline silicon or polycrystalline silicon are the two kind of most widely available silicon alternatives. But again, there's other stuff out there that people are trying out uh, like amorphous silicon. We'll talk about briefly gallium arsenide is another semiconductor um, compound that's used. Cadmium telluride is another one that's come up over the years. So once you get that right device that does something with its electrons, once the sun's light hits it, then we're, then we're starting to have something we can work with. But talking about silicon, which is still one of the more common ones, is the polycrystalline versus the monocrystalline. You can kind of see visually the difference in how they look. So polycrystalline, here it's it's poly it's many different types of crystals so it's kind of the natural way in which um in which silicon comes together and, and it's kind of jagged different crystal structure because of that it's uh cheaper to make something like polycrystalline monocrystalline is is uh, manufacturing the silicon to be all uniform in in texture and in um, crystal structure in this system so this is the one we saw earlier, right? And this is a polycrystalline. What are the pros and cons here? Well, you'll notice when you start looking at spec sheets and just start exploring different solar panels and things like that, uh, polycrystalline has less efficiency, but it's cheaper to produce. So that's kind of a trade-off. If, if you have, let's say, space to spare um, on your rooftop or your yard or your your location. If you have no space constraints and you have as much space as you need, you can probably be more cost effective with getting polycrystalline panels. But if you have a limited amount of space, let's say, you know, a limited 100 square feet on top of a roof or something like that, monocrystalline is more efficient, but it's also more expensive because it takes longer and, and more in intensive to produce than uh, polycrystalline. So, more expensive, but they're more efficient. So if you're if you're strapped for um, for space, the monocrystalline is the way to go. And then there's the um, other consideration of amorphous. So amorphous silicon is really kind of a free flowing crystal structure without actually much crystal structure to begin with at all. And because of that, whoops, it it is more flexible. So this is an example of an amorphous silicon panel. It can be bent, it can be kind of rolled up, it can be put on a cur curvaceous uh, surface like a, like a windowsill or a sloped roof or as, used as a solar shingle. A, a lot of companies are offering amorphous silicon in the sense of um, solar shingles uh, that can be just laid in any sort of application. Because it's amorphous and kind of random, it's less efficient than the other two that are crystalline. But you can see how you can see how maybe it can be used in more areas because it's flexible. It's easy to roll out. It's easy to deploy, you know, on the top of your car. Right? Some solar-powered cars that are out there, solar-powered plane uh, that we talk about in, in our two-day uh, photovoltaic class. Um, a solar-powered, you know, a small uh, what do you call it? Uh, 
a dune buggy or you know a golf cart is solar powered golf carts with amorphous on top that can be you know you don't need a whole panel on the car you can just line the top of the car with these things so, so these are kind of the real value here even though they're not as efficient they are more flexible okay. so there's different kind of products out there in the market and what you find in each of these solar cells, the solar options, is what we call the IV curve. This is this is getting to the this is about the level of complexity I'll get to when it comes to how how photovoltaic panels work. And then you know I'll just talk a little bit more after this about the whole maintenance of, and some of the best practices of care for these panels, and then I'll see which questions we can take at the end. Okay. Um, so the IV curve, IV is not, you know, intravenous, it's not something you put in your arm, um, but it is IV, if you recall back to um, earlier, it's the current voltage, so current and voltage curve. This thing uh, can't have its cake and eat it too, so to speak. You can't have maximum current and maximum voltage at all times. Uh, you have to trade off current with voltage, so if you want this panel to push harder, and provide more voltage, then you should expect less current. And if you want more current, you're going to have to expect a trade off in the voltage. And so that's really um, what this curve is telling us that let's say we want just uh, so we start here, right, on this side of the, the curve where there's zero, zero amps flowing through the wire. When does a does a solar panel have zero amps flowing, even though the sun's shining? It's when one side to the other of the panel is not connected to anything, right? If it's not connected to anything, uh, the solar panel is not going to give you any current. So that's what we call an open circuit, um, where you know the positive and the negative lead of the solar panel are just sitting there without anything connected to it. But if you put an electrical meter on both of those positive and negative leads, those those connectors on the solar panel, it'll give you a reading, and that reading is the open circuit voltage or VOC. Uh, open circuit voltage. That's if this panel doesn't have any load attached to it, it'll give you this voltage. That's the best case. That's the highest voltage you can possibly ask for. Obviously, that doesn't mean too much to us if we're trying to hook these up somewhere, right? And so um, the voltage starts dropping off a little bit as we try to get some current flowing. And if we take it all the way to the other side, We'll, we'll start being able to see more and more current flow until we kind of even out. So um, we kind of even out and max, max out at this current that, that this uh, solar panel can produce or the solar cell can produce up to the point where we have no voltage being produced and all the current being produced. How does that work? Well, um, I want to ask anyone here, how do I get the most current to flow as possible on a device? Well, if you've ever uh, pranked someone or ever had the misfortune of experiencing this, you put the hot and the neutral together or the plus and the minus wire directly together and you cause what we call a boom right, or a short circuit. Um, you don't you want to avoid that <laughs> um, short circuits are you try to avoid that. But there is a, a good metric for um, for solar panels is their short circuit current. So how much current will they pump out at you if you, for any reason, lost your resistance and went completely wire to wire from positive to negative. Um, that's the short circuit current. So that's the maximum current and the maximum voltage. But then somewhere in between is a sweet spot. And that's right here, usually along the, the IV curve, where the, the current has dropped off just a little bit from its maximum and the voltage has dropped off just a little bit from its maximum, where you put them together, voltage and amps together, it gives you the most watts possible, right? Because if the panel operated here, you wouldn't get much uh, watts with the volts and amps together. Over here, you wouldn't, but right here is the sweet spot. So this is where you want to kind of operate your cell. And if you find yourself, let's say, starting to measure more volts, and this is where the care and maintenance comes in. If you're doing your measurements once a, once a year or every six months on these, and you start seeing the voltage go over here or over to there, we know that we might want to start doing some more inspection on these panels. Okay, so that's kind of on the cell level. We all know that solar panels don't exist all by themselves. They need a bunch of extra equipment to be able to work in their system as well. And so 
at the end of the day, those electrons start flowing down that wire on the top layer that we saw earlier, and they're producing what we call direct current or DC power. That direct current, it means the electrons are flowing in one direction, they're not flowing back and they're not alternating. They're just going straight into the home or straight into the business. Unfortunately, um, your businesses are homes. They don't operate on DC power in most cases. They operate on AC or alternating current where the, the current's fluctuating 60 times every second. So to get that power from a PV panel, photovoltaic panel, into a language that our devices and our homes and businesses can, can um, use, we need something we call an inverter. And so an inverter is a good part of a whole system where the DC power produced by the panels needs to be turned into alternating power through an um, electronic device called an inverter. These are really, uh, again, for a whole new week-long class just on how inverters work. There's a lot of complication in there with all the electronics. But at the end of the day, they turn DC power into AC. And so one way we could wire in a solar panel into a system is that get the panels directly into DC loads. There are such things like light bulbs, like LEDs. You may have been hearing about these LEDs, uh, DC powered motors or batteries based systems um, that power off of DC only. They're rare and they need special connections and things. And they're normally powered off of batteries like our phone or our, our laptop when it's not plugged into the wall, that kind of thing. Or if we want it to speak our normal language of our homes where we can plug stuff into a regular outlet, we need that inverter. So the, the panel produces DC, goes into the inverter, the inverter does its magic, and now we have AC alternating current over to AC loads like our motors, our refrigerator, our TV, and so on and so forth. All right, so just for the next few minutes, I wanna talk a little bit about care of our um, solar panels, right? And, and kind of what are some best practices? We can't get into them all, but what I can share with you is that the National Renewable Energy Lab, we call them NREL, N-R-E-L, they produced an, an exhaustive report that you could, all can read immediately after this webinar, if you like, and just really dive into those 100 pages of best practices for operation and maintenance of photovoltaic and energy storage systems. And this is the third edition that just came out in 2019. Um, and it's really an exhaustive look at some considerations you should have for care of your solar panels. And so I'm going to highlight some of the things that that we found most interesting in this report that that are really good to highlight on this webinar. And then we'll take time for questions. Definitely find this report for yourself. It's freely available um, through the National Renewable Energy Lab. First and foremost, what are some PM or preventative maintenance activities we can we can run on our solar panels themselves? That's what we're going to focus on. We're not going to get into all the peripheral equipment like inverters necessarily. We don't really have time. But as you can imagine, these solar panels, even though they're not moving, so you're not dealing with you know bearings breaking down or vibration and that kind of stuff. What you do have in its place is the fact that these are out in the elements, right? So they're out in the dust and the snow and the rain and the bird poop and, you know, all the other stuff, the ice that can happen um, and all that kind of stuff. So cleaning uh, needs to be really um, part of the plan on how you're going to clean the photovoltaic panels. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you want to try to avoid just doing it yourself, just kind of, you know, haphazardly wiping it down with, uh, you know, steel wool or just whatever brush you have laying around or whatever a cleaning solution you have laying around because these, uh, these uh, laminations on top of the solar panels are a very specific, you know, chemical compound that can be compromised if you use harsher types of solvents or more abrasive materials. Um, Imagine scratching the glass, for instance, on the, um, the top of the solar panel, you're immediately just uh, obstructing the ability for light to get through to the cell. And that means uh, the efficiency of this panel starts dropping and you get less money for your dollar. So it's really good. Uh, there's a lot of official and regional module, uh, PV module cleaners available, cleaning services you know, that they can charge just a one-time fee and, and they'll do a full cleaning with the, with the correctly rated equipment for your system. But if you're gonna do it yourself, uh, again, not recommended, uh, but it, use soft bristled brushes or try to avoid using brushes altogether, okay? 
Snow removal is another thing for people like me. We're coming at you in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, snow removal is a reality for anyone above that level of latitude where we get snow. Um, a good kind of thing that designers of solar panels do is they tend to um, angle up the solar panels in the winter time, the fall and the winter. Um, so, you know, a six month rotation of going up onto that rooftop, let's say, and angling up the solar panels a little bit. The main reason we do that is because now the sun is at a angle so that the sun is hitting these more dead on if these are south facing. So if the sun is more directly hitting these solar panels, then uh, it'll get more output because it's facing the sun more directly. And then um, another benefit that this higher angle provides, I think you see where I'm going here, is that the snow will just more naturally fall off the solar panel as well and, and help you avoid some of that snow removal. So it kind of serves a dual purpose for, um, for maintenance of the solar panels. But at the end of the day, even snow, um, and this, you'll see this in the NREL report as well, um, the snow is uh, sometimes it's, it's still a consideration because the rooftop might only be able to handle so many pounds. And I, one of you asked a great question um, before the session began about, you know, what roofing materials am I allowed to use for my solar installation? And the answer is, well, you're allowed to use pretty much any roof there is. You just have to have different considerations there is. But certain roofs have different um, total load requirements or total pounds that can be loaded on there. And the NREL report, I'll, I'll refer that multiple times, is really exhaustive about analyzing the different types of roofing materials and how much it might cost to replace and repair them and considerations. So yeah, snow removal still might need to happen even though these naturally slide off at higher than 30 degree angles, you still might have to go up there and clear out snow just to make sure your roof doesn't cave in. So be, be aware of that. Uh, dust, so dust, agricultural, industrial, pollen cleaning, same thing uh, with the cleaning considerations. And then finally, any good PM, and really I will take this to a PDM, a uh, predictive maintenance perspective on these panels, um, is if, if you can use IR scanning, an infrared thermography company, a specialist to come in and do a correctly calibrated infrared um, thermography scan of these panels, you can really see where the problem spots are that maybe your naked eye cannot. It'll show for in the case of this example right here, which part of that solar panel, which cells are giving us issues. If cells are heating up like this, you can see the red. Uh, these cells are much hotter than the ones around them. That might mean they're, they're starting to fail and there's something physically going wrong with them versus what's going on around them. And, that, and each time one of these gets hotter than the rest, that extra heat, if you think about one thing I forgot to mention is if you have that 100 watts of solar power coming in and only 15 watts coming out, where do the other 85 watts go? They can't just disappear. They all come out of the solar panel as heat. Right, so heat that is just rising up off these solar panels, they get really hot. If anyone has ever touched a solar panel in operation, it's really hot. So if there's extra heat being get, get given off of these panels beyond the manufacturer specifications, that means the solar, um, the heat is rising. And that means in, in turn that we're getting less efficiency for our dollar. So that's some, just some initial considerations there. Um, other ones, checking the torque. All manufacturers and all electrical equipment have a manufacturer spec for torque. So how tight these um, screws and connections need to be in terms of foot pounds or, or Newton meters of uh, force in using a correctly calibrated um, torquing instrument uh, to tighten those down. As of the 2017 National Electrical Code is part of um, is a real uh, big motivator for starting to officially require all these torquings to be done at least every five years or if not sooner, depending on the manufacturer's recommendations, especially if you're outdoors in a, in a volatile environment with wind and snow and rain, that can happen. All this kind of stuff has to do with being out in the, um, in the environment, right? Checking your torques, uh, checking for corrosion and yellowing. Uh, yellowing is another really interesting thing um, where the coating that's on top of these panels can actually come directly from the manufacturer, um, causing an unwanted chemical reaction with the with the cells. And I think I have a picture of them coming up of what these yellow cells and they can straight off the shelf can actually just have have a manufacturer's defect that was in action during chipping that can cause problems. So just the visual inspection, making sure the yellowing doesn't happen in galvanization, there's no rusting happening. So a lot of visual inspection is is involved in place of mechanical replacements and inspections.
here's a cleaning. So cleaning panels, you see this very soft bristled brush using the right amount of um, solvents here in this case. And again, we always recommend using uh, panels. Uh, interesting tidbit here that we're finding is that uh, proper cleaning does make these panels up to 20% more efficient, right? So that's not 20% efficient, that's that's high, but 20% more. So let's say you're, you're only pulling 12% efficiency, right? That's less than the 15 we want. But then you start cleaning these things, you clean all the dirt and the bird poop off of them, and you get somewhere from 12 um, watts you're producing to 15, right? And then you get back up into the specs. So this is what they look like before. And over here, you can see what difference that can make in terms of letting light through. Here's that yellowing I wanted to tell you about. So you can kind of, it's, it's subtle, but you can see it. If the panels are starting to look yellow, uh, you, can, you can see that there's an issue there as well. Another thing that can happen straight from the manufacturer, especially if these are get, being shipped to you, uh, the frame can get bent and be defective in, in terms of not sealed properly. Um, these cells are supposed to be sealed off from the elements in the environment. But if the glass ever gets shattered or broken in manufacturing or shipping, um, you immediately start seeing issues with the panel. And, and then when that rainwater gets in with electrical electrons flowing, uh, a lot of short circuits and, and issues happen inside the panel from there as well. Interesting uh, pie chart from the IEA is kind of the breakdown of the different uh, main causes, the failure rates according to customer complaints for um, solar panels. And that is, um, so I'll, I'll just talk for a little bit, um, just maybe a two or three more minutes and then I'll try to take as many of your questions as possible. I want to honor your one minute or sorry, your one hour um, time commitment here. So I want to make sure to honor that for you. Uh, but 20% is that optical failure. So the, the biggest one is that if these things are fail failing because they're not able to get, um, they're not able to get the process of photovoltaics happening and the light through to them. Power loss, so they're just not producing as much as they used to. And that's because connections are coming loose over time or whatever. Um, and then all the kind of uh, connected stuff, right? It, it has to do with it other than that. Uh, let's see, uh, kind of all the same stuff. Other than the panels, I just would say that this NREL report, check it out because it starts getting into things like AC wiring. So not just the panels themselves, but you have all the wiring and all the conduit that goes all around to um, the inverter and the uh, disconnect switches and all the other stuff that you have to make sure you, you're torquing as well, checking their position, inspecting them for not only corrosion, but yeah, water and insects. Man, oh man, <laughs> snakes, rats, mouse, birds making nests. Um, that's a big one, birds making nests inside these panels like this. <laughs> so these birds said, oh, these, these are nice and warm spots to sit. And this is straight out of that report. And so thank you for letting me use this. <laughs> um, bird poop, right? It's just a reality of, of having stuff on a, on a, a rooftop. They affect the um, solar panels performance significantly. So that's something you want to be aware of as well. Nesting can happen inside these uh, connector boxes and combiner boxes as well. So it's, it's always good to run that visual inspection. Uh, going back to this, some of the electrical testing, testing that open circuit voltage, you remember that. You pull the panel out of service, it's not connected to anything, and then you measure that voltage. Is it still what the manufacturer gave you? Um, it's good to have an electrician do that because you're still dealing with live DC voltage, which can seriously shock you if you're not careful. Ballasted, this is another thing about roof systems. And I'm going to actually go to that right now, roof systems. So there's a couple different ways to approach attaching these to the roof, ballasted or directly connected uh, or attached to the roof. Ballasted means, you know, they're, you're just weighing them down so they're not going to go anywhere with, you know, cinder blocks or just extra weights. Um, obviously, that's not going to work on a roof like this one that's highly sloped or pitched. But on a flat roof, maybe ballasting is more cost effective. Um, this is where it comes back to the roofing material question about if you're using a softer material like SBS, styrene, butadiene, styrene, um, and some of these softer materials on the roof, uh, they might not handle the ballasting very well and they might start breaking down. You might need direct connections at that point. But you definitely want to leave, if you're connecting to a roof, uh, making sure that there is that four to six inch airspace between roofs 
the roof and modules for airflow because these do get hot and so we don't want them just melting in place or breaking down just because there's no place for air to to move um, weatherproofing any holes uh, in the roof itself to prevent leaks a lot of roofing companies you know work closely with the module um, the module installers to make sure that the they're covered in the warranty for the roof, but not always, especially if you didn't communicate clearly with that professional roofer. Um, so make sure you can discuss uh, warranty, um, inspection uh, upon initial uh, installation of these things, and making sure that these cuts into the roof and these uh, connections into the roof are made uh, in such a way that there's not going to be water leaking into the rooms in the building. Sloped roofs, uh, the, the report, NREL report talks about this as well. And that is on sloped roofs, um, you, get, you can get more of direct access to the sun potentially because if you're in the winter, it's at an angle. However, there's a lot more um, cost associated with maintenance because you can't really just walk up there anymore. You have to have lifts and things. So the report estimates some of the cost ideas, including this one, right? Uh, different types of roofing, thermoplastic, ethylene, polyvinyl chloride, um, bituminous. This is straight out of that report as well. Um, asphalt, different types of... Um, roofing materials and kind of the estimates that they're seeing from all their data of how much it costs to repair this roof if something needs to be repaired with that solar panel um, and how to repair that part of the roof. 20 bucks per meter, square square meter. Think about that, three feet by three feet. 20 bucks, 20 bucks, 15 bucks, 40 bucks. It, it kind of varies by type. And here's how many hours it would take to repair a one meter squared of that roof. And finally, I will close. I know I only have five minutes left, but I'm going to try to answer a few of your questions. And in the meantime, um, always feel free to ask um, more questions in a, in a follow up um, in the email I'm going to send you. And, and we can, I mean, we offer a two day classes, right? So I can only get so far into solar before we really need to spend more time. Uh, take a two day class. So we'll come to you and, and offer a, another photovoltaics class for you online or in person. So, one thing to consider is we've talked mostly about this, right? The solar panel array. But there's all the other um, attached devices that we were mentioning. Combiner box, which takes all the DC signals, combines it into one. Disconnecting that DC, which is important as part of the code requirements, taking us to the breaker panel for DC that can break, can disconnect the solar from the rest of the system. The inverter we talked about, AC disconnects, AC breakers, and then the kilowatt hour meter, which may or may not be a net meter. And then going into the, the home for, um, for use by our appliances, but also out to the grid to, for us to pay back. So there's all sorts of devices. This is just a quick taste of not only are we maintaining these, but we're maintaining one, two, three, four, five, six, seven plus different things as well. And um, highly recommend you read that NREL report to get a little bit more info and then reach out to us if you continue to have some more questions. So um, let's see here. Uh, for now, I think we can really start seeing if you have any questions. We've got a, a good amount of curiosity on the line. I apologize in advance. Can't get to all the questions, but um, yeah, we got we had this good question. I'm, I'm, I'm happy I was able to answer this one about where does that remaining energy go if the efficiency is so low? And the answer is absolutely, it, it all gets dissipated as heat. So those 85 watts for every 100 watts, let's say, goes up into the air as heat. Um, will there be a separate training for the rest of the components in a solar system? Yeah, inverters, batteries, et cetera. You know what, based on um, demand, we can definitely do stuff like that. Uh, our company kind of specializes in electrical systems. So inverters, batteries, I think it's definitely something we can do um, as a further webinar topic. By the way, Jade Learning, if any of you have taken electrical courses with Jade, they're, they're offering a, a new solar powered class. Um, some of you asking about, uh, some of the requirements for solar, you know, what's required for in installing this way or that way. Um, I would just answer that by saying there are a whole set of requirements in Article 690, if you want to write this down, 690 for solar powered uh, photovoltaic systems um, in the National Electrical Code. So, you, you know, this, this book is a thousand pages long. You can spare yourself that unless you want some good reading, <laughs> but you can flip to chapter six of the nine chapters and go to chap, uh, Article 690 and read all about the requirements from the National Electrical Code. They have requirements for wire protection, as you can imagine, out in the elements. They have requirements for the DC part of the circuit disconnects and, and switches and grounding and all that fun stuff. Um, 
there's there's a lot to go um, into that in terms of coatings, in terms of all that fun stuff. Um, hot spots typically be on an entire cell. Um, you would think it would be, especially in these um, monocrystalline cells, which, you know, if one part's getting hot, it's kind of spreading through the crystal structure. For a polycrystalline, maybe it will be more piecemeal, depending on kind of the jagged um, material here. In my one minute remaining, um, you know, this is a great question. We can talk about environmental impact. So one, one attendee is talking about um, what is the solar industry doing to reduce the negative environmental impacts that come from the production of solar panels? So for instance, right, the silicon has to be mined out of the ground, right? Um, I wish I could answer that in 30 seconds, but unfortunately, um, it, it's a really good question, um, and I can't answer it all. But but the industry, and I'm sure the National Renewable Energy Lab can attest, there's smart people all over the place looking at ways to get solar powered materials created with less environmental impact and um and making sure that the environmental savings or the savings in let's say greenhouse gases and that kind of thing um, during operation of the solar panel far outweighs the costs of mining it out of the ground and better yet um the cost of mining silicon out of the ground to make a solar panel is hopefully can be made to be far less than what it takes to mine coal and natural gas, which are the alternatives, right, to solar power. So there's all sorts of analysis going down from, from a um, large scale perspective. I've been part of those analyses before in previous work. And there's a lot of complexities there, obviously, as electricity is used by everyone. You're, you're never more than, you know, one foot from an electrical panel at any time. So just keep that in mind um, that it, it is being worked on. And um, it's kind of a something is better than nothing kind of approach. It's way better than the alternative, but it's not perfect either. So the, there's kind of a lot of opportunities for people to do more work with solar panels and improving them. So thank you all for your great questions. I, again, apologize in advance. I can't get to all of them, but let's definitely uh, talk some more. Feel free to call this number up and, and talk to us and see if we can answer any of your more questions and, and get you into more training opportunities for solar and for electrical and all these other great things. So thank you so much for your time and have a great day.